increased by 2030 to somewhere around 110 million barrels per day. And then they look at all the current production and all the projected production that we know about into the future from all the various sources of liquid fuel, basically oil, around the world. And they see out at 2030 a 60 million barrel per day shortfall, which they label unidentified projects. Okay, well, we're going to save this with the oil sands, right? Let's take a look at the oil sands. So the oil sands in Canada currently produce 1.3 million barrels of oil a day. We're going to invest $200 billion to dig up a large portion of northern Alberta to increase the production of oil sands, oil, over the next, uh, over the next 20 years or so, by 2030. And with that enormous investment, we'll have increased oil production to 5 million barrels a day which is about half of what Saudi Arabia produces right now. So where does that figure on here? Well, that's current oil sands production right here, that light blue line. And then as we go into the future, that current production declines a little bit because it wears out. And then this is future oil sands production, that orange line there. And as we get out to 2030, that's the contribution to the global oil supply right there from the oil sands in Canada. And by the way, we will have exhausted all conventional oil in Alberta by then. So that will be it for Canada's contribution. So we have a, an oil problem, and, and the oil problem can be stated as simply as this. Uh, it's getting energetically more costly to get every additional barrel of oil. Drillers have to go farther into more hostile natural environments to drill deeper for smaller pools of lower quality oil. You have to work harder for every extra barrel. And unfortunately, we're not making the kinds of investments we need to fill that gap of 60 million barrels a day. 2030. So, if you talk to folks who are concerned about the implications of this for national security, like the Department of Defense in the United States, uh, they put this at the top of the threats for, to American national security, way ahead of China. Okay? So this is the Joint Operating Environment Report for 2010 from the Department of Defense in the United States, and uh, this is a scan of the horizon of threats to American national security. Next slide, Matt, please. So they say by 2012, surplus oil production capacity will have essentially uh, disappeared, and as early as 2015, the shortfall could be up to 10 million barrels a day, and an energy crunch of enormously disruptive proportions that they regard as almost inevitable on the planet. Well, the situation uh, has real implications for our lives here. And one of the things I think you guys need to think about in your planning is you need to start thinking about uh, urban environments and settlement patterns that are going to be able to cope with a radically different energy regime, where energy in general is much more expensive than it is right now. Uh, one of the concerns in terms of a shock possibility is what we could call a liquid fuel emergency. About 40 to 50 percent of the world's oil travels on oceans to get to its final destination. A good portion of it travels through uh, choke points. Unfortunately, the slides seem to have shrunk. Uh, so you're going to have to look carefully. This is a map of the world. And we see the Strait of Hormuz here, which is at the end of the Persian Gulf. About 17 million barrels a day travels through the Strait of Hormuz. That's about 20 percent of world oil production. Now, let's try the next slide. Next slide, please. Uh, what is a, a possible threat to that, that flow of oil? Well, people have been concerned about the, the Straits of Hormuz for quite some time. One of the real concerns now is a possible war between Israel and Iran. Uh, Israel wants to stop or at least slow down the Iranian campaign to develop nuclear weapons. Uh, if they were to launch an attack, they'd almost certainly have to cross Saudi Arabian airspace and, and refuel over Saudi Arabia. Saudi Arabia has apparently already given them essentially tacit permission to do so. There's no love loss between Saudi Arabia and Iran. Every time this scenario is gained by war gamers in the Pentagon and elsewhere, Iran in response attacks Saudi oil production facilities and ports, and in some cases tries to close the Straits of Hormuz. If you take 20% of the world's oil off the market instantaneously, then our currently roughly $100 a barrel of oil could go to two, $300 virtually overnight. That would 
significantly harm the global economy uh, and drive us into a much worse recession than we have seen over the last couple of years. Now, Eastern Canada is particularly vulnerable to this. You'd think this is a pretty significant public policy issue because, you know, the folks who are thinking about the possibility of a war between Israel and Iran have been putting the probability at somewhere between 20%, 25%, and as far as 50% over the, over the next five years or so. That somewhere in that five-year span, uh, you have a pretty good chance that Israel is going to try to, to attack Iran. It turns out Eastern Canada, as you can see from this slide, is extremely vulnerable to an oil shock. In fact, somewhere around Toronto, you can kind of draw a line down the middle of the city and go east from there. Uh, the eastern part of Canada is a lot like Japan, about 90% dependent upon uh, foreign sources of oil. Now, we think that we're an energy abundant country, and in the aggregate, we are. We got lots of oil, but we ship most of it to the states. And our pipelines don't go far enough east to allow us to take the stuff in Alberta and take it out, out east. And, as you notice, this is a real problem in terms of the resilience of the Canadian economy. Canada has no strategic reserve. In the United States, they've pumped tens of millions of barrels of oil into salt domes and things just for this eventuality. Canada has nothing. Nothing. Well, let me just give you, what I'm trying to do is give you an indication of the vulnerabilities we have to uh, sudden shifts in our system, what specialists, complexity specialists call non-linearities, surprises if you might. So what should we do? Now I get to the prescription part of my presentation and get a chance to talk about resilience a little bit. Well, the first thing is, I don't want everybody to run out and slip their wrists. <laughs> I always have to make a judgment when audiences I show this to. I mean, I, I have to admit, sometimes I feel like this, and I just want to go away and bury my head in the sand and hope it all goes away, but this stuff, and this is the world, unfortunately, and we need to think about this. So what are we going to do in, in a practical way? We need to think about resilience. Now, I understand that uh, earlier today you had some folks who talked about resilience. I wish I'd been here for that. Uh, uh, it was one of the first to start using this concept and thinking about its implications for public policy uh, almost a decade ago. I see that it's percolated into a lot of conversations now, which is terrific. But I, I see that also sometimes it's misunderstood or misused. Uh, it actually is derived originally from the work of ecologists, in particular one ecologist, probably the greatest Canadian ecologist, Buzz Hollick. If there were a Nobel Prize for ecology, Buzz would have won it. Uh, and he founded an international organization called the Resilience Alliance, which is a, a, an international network of scientists thinking about the implications of resilience for all kinds of systems, not just ecological systems, but political systems, social systems infrastructure systems. If you're interested in resilience, you should check out the Resilience Alliance. Well, what in that work does resilience mean? So resilient people, according to this way of thinking, have the capacity to withstand shock. People, institutions, or societies have the capacity to withstand shock without catastrophic failure. Resilient people, institutions, and societies are self-reliant, and they're creative in response to novel challenges. So they, they have the possibility of moving somewhere unexpected in response to the unexpected. And we can go through what the components of resilience are. If you're trying to make a system resilient, what do you do? These are some of the things. I can talk about these at length. And within each area of planning, you need to think about how they would be applied. Loosen coupling means that you want to, you want to try to uh, in a sense, metaphorically, move things apart and lessen the connectivity between them a bit. Because when things are really close together and tightly connected, in an electrical grid, a food system, in a traffic system, or whatever, then if one part of that system is disrupted, it's more likely you're going to get a cascading failure across the system, like a row of dominoes falling over. So loosening coupling means reducing the, the possibility or the probability of, of that kind of cascading failure. Increasing redundancy means you look at whatever system you're interested in and you look for the parts of that system that if they're lost will do an enormous damage, amount of damage. You take that node out of the network or that hub and the whole thing falls apart in your electrical grid, your food system, your transportation network, your economy or what. 